Can a surrogate narrowly tailor an Article 17a guardianship just like they would an Article 81 guardianship? To find out, you have to read Matter of Yvette A, but it's seven pages. Don't have time for that? I've got you covered. This is TLDR, Too Long Didn't Read, where normally I cover New York Court of Appeals cases and I try to do it in five minutes or less. But this is part of a special limited series I'm doing on cases relevant to the elder law and estate planning community. This is the case of Matter of Yvette A. The citation for this case is 2020, is 2010, New York Slip Opinion 20128, published by the Surrogates Court of New York County on March 25th of 2010. This is a little bit of an older case, but it's sort of an evergreen issue. The issue in this case is whether a surrogates court can narrowly tailor an Article 17a guardianship to have a lot of restrictions and protections the same way that an Article 81 guardianship would have. Uh, the background, the briefly to, ha- to help understand and appreciate the context of this case, is that New York has different kinds of guardianships. One kind of guardianship is an Article 81 guardianship, which is considered a narrowly tailored guardianship. There's a presumption of capacity. You have to overcome that presumption in a, in a proceeding to establish necessity and also um, incapacity or consent. And the resulting guardianship has specific powers that are narrowly tailored to the needs and uh, abilities of the, a, of the IP, of the incapacitated person. An alternative is Article 17A, and that's only for intellectually disabled people. And it's considered a, a more plenary, a more all-inclusive kind of guardianship. It doesn't delineate the specific powers or lack of powers generally. Uh, and it's a diagnosis-driven statute as opposed to a functional limitations-driven statute. To get a 17A, you just have to show uh, through two certifications by professionals, either two doctors or a doctor and a psychologist, that the person is intellectually disabled and it's se- it's severe and permanent or likely to last uh, indefinitely. Um, now, what are the facts of this case? The facts are that Yvette A is the subject of this case, and Yvette A is blind, has a history of seizures, anxiety, and is diagnosed with mental retardation when she was two and a half years old. She basically um, had a rough childhood. Her mom died when she was three. She had her dad, Angel A. He's the person that wants to be the guardian now. He was in her life for about a year and a half and then sent her to the Willowbrook School and sort of disengaged from her life for the next 11 years, had barely any, if barely any, if any contact with her. She was at the Willowbrook School and that has a history of social, uh, physical, and sexual abuse. And there was a big class action lawsuit. So she was removed from that and put into another school called the Episcopal uh, Social Services Group Home, where she lived for the next 33 years until this case was filed. Angel A got back involved in her life and filed an Article 17A guardianship. He said, I want to be her guardian. He files his application. He presents at the hearing to, he presents at the hearing evidence that she needs help with all the EDLs. She's also blind. She can't eat on her, on her own. She needs one-to-one supervision and assistance with everything. And there's doctors that say she has this, uh, she has severe mental, severe and permanent mental uh, retardation, does not have the c- capacity or ability to make decisions in any form or fashion. And Angel A at the hearing says, I'm really sorry for not being involved in, in my daughter's life and Yvette's, Yvette's life for all this time, but I want to be involved. And here's the thing. At the hearing, all of the other people opposed the guardianship, said, we don't think Angel A should become the guardian in a 17A context. They, they, they were questioning his motives. They questioned his intent. They questioned his ability to stay involved in her life. And they questioned whether if he left again, like he did before, if it would hurt her, if it would result in more harm to Yvette A than she had. Uh, already. And so they say, judge, this really should be an Article 81 guardianship, which is more narrowly tailored. So the judge has this issue where everyone opposes, including MHLS, New York Civil Liberties Union, uh, the GAL, uh, the guardian ad litem. And it goes to the surrogate and the surrogate analyzes in the holding here, Article 81 versus 17A and says, yes, Article 81 is more narrowly tailored than 17A generally. And uh, 17A has an ability, though, in 1755 to modify a 17A guardianship to make it more narrowly tailored. And the judge says, there's nothing about the statute that prohibits me as a judge from narrowly tailoring it on the front end. If I can narrowly tailor it, if I can modify a 17A guardianship to meet the needs of the ward after it's been established, then it follows logically that I can also modify it at the outset to address the specific uh, objections by everybody in this case, the judge, the surrogate in this case, imposes a bunch of restrictions that make it sound a lot like an Article 81 guardianship. The guardian must file initial and annual reports. 
Uh, the reports are due within six months. The Guardian has to identify his current address and phone number. The Guardian has to include in the reports if that's residence, residency, the dates of his visits, her medical condition, her status, her programs, any intent he has to move her. In short, the surrogate in this case holds that if it's appropriate, as it is in, as it is in this case, the court has the authority and the ability to narrowly tailor an Article 17a guardianship, just like it would an Article 81 guardianship. And that's the case of matter of Yvette A. Have a good day. If you like what you just saw and want to see more just like it, please hit like or subscribe to let me know.